I need some traction. You need some traction. Hey everyone, Lloyd Lobo here, co-founder at Boast AI and Traction. Today's webinar is brought to you by Boast AI Launch Academy in partnership with Growth Blazers, Founder Institute, and Lazaridis Institute. So what is really strange is this webinar was hosted initially by Vasil from Growth Blazers and only half recorded. So I, me and Nadia are doing the recording again. You'll hear the intro from me, but all the Q&A portion and uh, everything else will come at the end with Vasil facilitating it. And couldn't be more excited than to have my friend Nadia here, total champ on the growth marketing side, has taken Vengage from zero to 10 million plus ARR and built a kick-ass team and the sharpest growth marketer on the planet that I know. Without further ado, Nadia, take it away. Hey everyone, uh, thanks so much for having me here at Traction. My name is Nadia, as mentioned, and I head growth over at Vengage. Uh, just a bit of context on Vengage, we're an infographic design solution, so we help uh, provide a design platform for simple, simple design platform for complex business communications uh, for different marketers, execs that are trying to communicate better visually. Uh, so today I want to talk about um, some of the processes that we've used at our early stage, come at the early stage part of Vengage. So when we were at that, you know, before 5 million ARR mark, um, some of the strategies that we used to start building up and scaling our team, specifically the marketing team. So I just do want to add a caveat that this is more, more effective for some of those early stage businesses. Once you kind of exceed that and you go into scaling your team into um, uh, more different structures, uh, this may not be as effective. So I just wanted to add that little detail at the beginning. So before we jump right into the, to the grit of the talk, um, I just wanna cover this video by Daniel Pink called The Puzzle of Motivation. Now it's a great TED talk and I've never been one who's given much thought to motivation and what motivates people until I started managing a team and realizing that each individual member on the team is actually quite complex. So in his book, uh, Drive, he breaks down motivation into three components and in his talk as well. And those three components are autonomy, which is the urge to direct one's own life, mastery, the desire to get better at something and purpose, the need to contribute to something bigger than ourselves. So seems simple enough, right? But if we're being honest, if there was really a, an easy topic of motivation and if it's that easy to just apply it, the self-help industry probably wouldn't be a multi-billion dollar industry. Now, when I first joined Vengage, and this is very similar with a lot of early stage businesses where you're a small team um, and you're just starting to get into that traction phase of your business, um, the there's this innate ability to be intrinsically motivated, right? So usually when there's a smaller team, we don't think so much about how to motivate others that much uh, because the people who are interested in joining a small growth uh, driven company are probably not thinking so much about security because by nature, a lot of these businesses are quite risky. So at the beginning, we were really hard on growth because we cared about growth and that was pretty much it, right? We just wanted to see results. But as companies grow, it becomes harder to rely on finding these intrinsically motivated people because not everybody's like that. More people are extrinsically motivated, meaning outside factors like money, security, esteem have a lot more of an impact on that motivation. And of course, like many early startups, eventually we needed, and you'll probably need more people on your team to scale. And after a few years of that, we're, we're now closer to about 60 people. Uh, but we had no major funding, we had no investment, we had, but we were cash flow positive. Um, but we had taken lean and strategic decisions uh, in order to scale. Uh, but one of the things that we realized is with a lot of growth comes a lot of growing pains, right? And if those pains aren't addressed really early on, the rate at which they increase is going to climb with all of that growth. Uh, so this is one of the things that we learned very early on and something that, that I hope that this talk will help kind of shift that need for. Uh, so today I want to share some of those methods that we found effective in building a team of growth-minded individuals to kind of lessen that pain and reduce uh, it consistently as you continue to scale up. So to clarify, I don't want to just tell you how to figure out, you know, which marketers to hire and what to look for. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that, but more importantly, I want to address and break down how you can train growth mindedness into people and why it's important for a number of reasons to the success of your entire marketing strategy and your company as a whole. Now, 
some of the major problems or personal problems that I've noticed that a lot of startups or smaller businesses uh, that don't really have a lot of funding to rely on face um, are, are these, uh, right? So hiring is a big one. Uh, so is training and onboarding. And of course, scaling as in building up those people with personal development plans so that they can continue to improve, you know, without relying on your input as their boss or um, without having their hands held necessarily. But of course, the struggle with hire, finding really great candidates who are already good at their jobs and have that proven you know, record of execution is that they're either already employed or they're really expensive, right? Uh, so what typically happens is that founders will either hire some type of intern or someone fresh out of school uh, and you know, post a job ad for something like growth marketers since that's the trend now. Um, and this seems like the best decision, hoping that that person will instinctively know how to grow anything. But because the founder is so busy trying to do all of the other things that you're uh, required to do in terms of maintaining the growth of your business, training and mentoring that new individual junior hire isn't always a priority, even though it probably should be. Uh, and then what happens? You know, the, that they're supposed to fend for themselves with little direction or understanding of what to do. And before you know it, you really have, have a hard time seeing a dent in your business the same way that you, you were hoping it would happen. Eventually you realize that because somebody says they're a growth marketer doesn't actually mean that they're, they know how to spend that time in growing a business. They don't know how to do that without spending a ton of cash upfront in order to scale. So what do you do? How do you actually scale a team um, of people without having a strong basis of experience, right? To help fuel that growth. So the answer for me and something I think is a, is a huge fundamental foundation of growth at any business is the people, right? We've managed to 10X our growth in revenue. Uh, and we did this at the beginning of uh, when I first joined Vengage with a relatively small team of about three people uh, in less than a couple of years. And the majority of that growth only started happening when our management team decided to take a very intentional shift in mindset and stop trying to find these quick win tactics and rather focus on improving the foundations of our culture and our company, um, and as a result, the people. Now, people need to be aligned in order to be able to do their best work. Um, and one of the best ways to align these people is on the vision of your company and on the vision of your business. If you can paint that picture of what success looks like for a lot of individuals, especially those junior hires, not only are they untrained, which means it's easier to train them up, uh, and I say this because it's harder to untrain somebody who's stuck in their ways, it's easier to train somebody who's coming in with a fresh mind and open mind. Um, and so if you can align them to that vision and help paint that picture of what success looks like, once you have that alignment, that foundation starts to connect, right? And everything else starts to stack up on top of that. So what do people need in order to be aligned to do their best work? Um, this is something that I like to look at in terms of breaking down uh, vision, strategy, and OKR into these little smaller segments. So when you're thinking about vision, and this is kind of what you want to use in order to paint this picture, vision describes where you're going, right? This is a little bit more aspirational. It's not always going to be a very direct line of success. Strategy, uh, think of it as the road of getting there. OKRs are your milestones along that road that you need to hit in order to express success. Uh, and execution are the actual things that you're going to do in order to hit those goals. One thing I recommend is putting all of this stuff in a one pager that your entire team can reference. So a simple statement like that vision, uh, as I mentioned, should be able to paint that clear picture of what success looks like. Your strategy should be a visual representation of what that path might look like over the five years, three years, and then another uh, over the span of the specific year that you're working on. Uh, sometimes adding a layer of team ownership, depending on how big your team is, whether it's an individual person or a, a group or a sub team, um, having that structure vis visible to show where ownership sits um, is also really important. OKR is broken down by team into high level outcomes. So the high level outcomes of what you want to influence should also be like influenced on this document. And then you can start layering in different KPIs or elements of execution that will reflect what you need to do to hit those objectives. So part of this uh, and part of doing this is to help uh, alleviate some potentials for bottleneck that will eventually come uh, later on as you continue to grow, right? So how do you get other people to actually realize that vision 
um, can be kind of tricky if you're the one that's already been executing. So this is another situation where if you've already hired, you know, a lot of, you've hired somebody who's relatively good at tactics and execution, and now you want to scale your team, um, the bottleneck problem becomes a huge issue for founders who are, you know, in the grunt work, doing that grunt work, are in the weeds, or even have somebody who's maybe their second in command who is also doing a lot of that execution work. Now, this is a pretty big problem and something that's really hard to address or, uh, if you don't if you don't fix it early on and then you you know you procrastinate on it and you try to fix that bottleneck later, uh, it becomes a lot more of a struggle. So. One of the things that I've done here is to try to visualize how I see the bottleneck problem actually impacting business. Um, so let's say you're the first person at the company or the first execution at, executioner at the company, which sounds kind of dangerous and scary. And I think that, that was the wrong word, but um, you as an individual who was hired to do this execution work, um, you know, you have your weekly tasks, your inputs, uh, and this bottle represents kind of like the vessel of what you can actually handle or your capacity. Um, so very simply, you put things in, so you put your tasks in, uh, and they come out as results, right? Before you lead your team, um, of course, there's a, a certain amount of uh, consistency that you've achieved by doing this flow, right? So every week you have a relatively consistent output, uh, you're putting things in, you're pushing them out, and ultimately you're just getting shit done. But the thing that nobody tells you is once your team grows, you get to that point where managing around three to five people, uh, your responsibility shifts, right? You're no longer doing that contributor job, at least not to the full extent. Uh, and after all, you have expectations and other responsibilities as you continue to hire new people. And if you've been that tactics person, chances are, especially in these early stage companies, you're probably gonna become the person who's managing and scaling that team. But realistically, you don't have the time to do all of that usual day-to-day -day work and also do a good job of managing, right? So leadership and understanding management expectations uh, is really, really necessary in terms of scaling effectively. So uh, just to go back, so as you start to, to hire these new people, again, your, your goals and your expectations become higher, right? So the level of output you're expected to achieve um, also goes up. Now, since most of these normal tasks that you're doing are relatively new, now let's say you're hiring you know, new individuals who are also junior that you're trying to train up. You get, you still have the same amount of tasks and the same amount of expectations, but now you have these new introduced, uh, newly introduced tasks, right? These are your manager tasks, which are these represented by these little diamonds that I've got here. Now, what's happening here is like each person that you've got, you're passing on a few of these tactics to or these tasks to, but you can see that most of their those bottles that I've represented here are relatively empty still, right? And so what happens is the tasks and the manager tasks as well start to pile up. And even though you have way more in entering your bottle, um, there's actually a lot less that's actually getting done because now your output has shifted, right? You look, you can see that the distribution of those Ex like executional tasks versus those managerial tasks um, have actually shrunk, right? Because you can't handle that capacity. And as a result, what happens is you tend to get major burnout. So what do we do as managers or new managers that kind of enter this position is we think to ourselves, you know, why not just put those manager tasks on hold because that way uh, the output won't drop and I can go back to having, you know, a consistent output of those tasks and the execution that I actually need. Now, this is a, a similar thing that I faced uh, at Vengage. So when we were doing a lot of our SEO growth, I was initially the one creating a lot of the content, doing a lot of the link building. And I figured out that process, but it was all in my head, right? So when new people came, it was really hard for me to get them to do it because it required me to take time and step away from doing the actual execution. And so my fear was if I stop, then they won't be able to um, then it will take time to get them to ramp up. And as a result, we'll lose a lot of our rankings, we'll lose a, a lot of that growth. And so this is kind of how we start thinking about it. At least this is how I started thinking about it. Uh, but that's ultimately the wrong decision, right? And the reason for that is, like I said, most of these new hires that you've got at your company, they have the capacity to do a lot more. And the thing is, especially at these junior stages in, their, in your company, these are also the people that are still intrinsically motivated. They want to do more, right? Uh, they just need the right guidance. 
Um, so when, I, when we say work and they have this capacity of doing a lot more work, it's those daily contribution tasks that we're talking about because your job as you hire more people is to step up and to do a little bit more of the strategy work and a little bit less of that repetitive execution work. And this is a gradual process, right? You're not one day just gonna stop doing all of it. Um, ideally, you're starting to shift your way up and constantly moving up that ladder. Uh, and so that's why that, that initial structure, that framework that I showed of the one pager is also a good uh, kind of path for your own success and your own growth. The KPIs are the individual contributions that your team is doing and you're slowly moving up and up that ladder. So as you can see, if we somehow found a way to delegate those previous tasks to other members of the team, we could also ensure that they're just as efficient in executing on those tasks as you used to be, right? So then your bottle might look something like this. So as you're distributing those uh, smaller tactic pieces, you can start giving yourself more capacity for these larger, more managerial tasks. So now, not only by doing this is your output higher, but you're not overwhelmed. You're leveraging your team to actually take on a lot of that responsibility from you. And as a result, the whole team's output is higher, right? Uh, and you have to maintain that alignment across uh, in, in order to ensure that people are being efficient. So there's a lot of moving parts here, um, but uh, you still have these contributor tasks that you have to work on. You're just like slowly, slowly um, improving your skills and your craft within your realm. So as a manager, you should be focusing, you know, less on work and rather on improving what's already working to figure out those new methods and strategies for growth to create better processes, better efficiency overall for your team so that everybody uh, can do a better job and can grow at a faster rate. So by building these growth minded and autonomous team members, you're actually eliminating that bottleneck uh, and paving that path for long term growth. So of course, the question is, how do you actually delegate effectively? How do you get people to get to that stage? Um, I wanna go over 10 best practices and skills that you can develop in order uh, to you know, structure your team in a way that fosters that continuous growth, that reliability, that autonomy that we all really want as successful entrepreneurs. So the first thing you need to do is define your core values. Now, the core values are the backbone of your business, right? These are the things that are more behavioral rather than tactics driven. Uh, one of the things that we do at Engage is we've spent a lot of time uh, you, you know, interviewing for, for core values and establishing a very strong culture. If you make the mistake, and we have made this mistake in the past, it starts to create this divide in your team. Culture is a huge part of making sure that there is that unified um, direction and that unified uh, feeling of wanting to grow and win. Uh, and then if you don't have the right core culture defined and you don't have the right people fitting that, you start to create these weird layers where you have some people who want more of like a corporate environment, some people who actually are still intrinsically motivated. There, it becomes a big problem and it becomes a lot of um, a lot of pain ultimately to make everybody happy. So having those values adds that layer of consistency and is kind of the foundation of, you know, why are we actually here? Uh, because a shaky culture becomes really, really hard to fix later on. So some of the examples of good core values uh, are I've listed over here. Um, I recommend checking them out in, if you're interested in, in creating some of these documents and if you haven't already. So at Vengage, we have five core values uh, for our company and each department, you know, defines these values for what it looks like for their own team. So uh, these different values, for instance, we own our jobs, uh, reflects autonomy and accountability. But we also break that down. Uh, so for the marketing team, I have an example of what that looks like for marketing specifically. Uh, and this is good to keep people um, on track. And this is actually how a lot of our performance reviews are done as it ties back to the core values rather than just on skill set, just on um, the actual execution work. Uh, one of the other things that we also do is we repeat this message frequently with examples. So this is just a quick uh, snapshot of one of the core values broken down into different elements and then something that you can actually repeat and create a habit of week by week uh, in your meeting. So this is actually something we do at Vengage as our CEO um, presents the core values every single week, somebody reads them out and it just reinforces that message a little bit and a little bit more every, uh, every single week that we do these meetings. 
So in order to also reinforce this message to your team, you need to show people specific examples that demonstrate how that behavior is being um, accomplished. So you're kind of trying to train and nurture that to become a habit. Uh, and if you continue to repeat that and you continue to practice it, um, eventually a lot more people will start to embody these core values and start to embody and understand what real success and real growth actually looks like for your business. The next step and the next tip uh, is that you need to set specific yet broad expectations. Uh, I know it's a little bit vague, but what I mean by this is you're trying to provide the what and the why to your team when you're setting goals and not the how. Um, you wanna set ambitious stretch goals. You wanna look into the data and trends to help guide those goals uh, and provide that guidance on figuring out you know, how to set those roadmaps, how to set those goals together with your team. But the part that you don't wanna do is you don't wanna tell them exactly how, because then it creates that mentality that anytime a problem comes up, they need to come to you to get it figured out. So when it's setting these goals, it's important to set the expectation of what you're doing, but you also wanna avoid a little bit of ambiguity, right? Um, so when I say give them the what, but not the how, uh, it doesn't mean you want to create this like high level goal that no one with en without any context will see, but you want to structure that context. So let's say I have a goal of improving customer retention by 5%, right? I might know what the inputs are to improving that customer retention, but that's because I have context, right? I've been at the company long enough. I've seen how that behavior shifts, but not everybody who's junior or who doesn't have all that context will be able to execute effectively on this. So as a good leader, your job is also to make sure that you're helping other people achieve their goals. Um, and so what helps is by breaking down these larger goals into smaller inputs, right? Uh, so let's say I break down improved customer retention into five small feet pieces. Uh, then I can start to break those down into more ta tangible things that people can actually do. And this is the stuff that you wanna delegate to your team. So let's say I know that people who've engaged with support are more likely to uh, stick around longer. So then what I can say is, hey, we're going to improve customer retention by 5%. Now you take this piece and you go figure out how to get more people into support. It becomes something a lot more structured uh, that's less ambiguous. And if people can achieve their goals and they are feeling confident, they'll do a much better job, right? People who don't have that direction, that alignment um, will likely not be as effective. So the next part of your job really is to figure out how to break those larger goals down into input. So this is a, a closer look at breaking these bigger goals down. Now, so for instance, that, uh, the marketing goals at FedGage, we focus a lot on acquisition or we used to focus a lot on acquisition. Um, there's a total volume of traffic that I know we would need to hit in, in order to achieve our revenue goals. So I know that the revenue inputs um, might not be totally understood by a lot of the different people at the team, but it's even traffic is too broad, right? So as we continue to break these goals down, um, we can start to figure out which channels I need to, uh, we need to go after. We can figure out what those monthly inputs look like, what the weekly goals are, and then start to break that down into actual action items that go into our roadmaps. So and once you break it down, depending on what level your team is at, but especially with junior hires, um, you kind of want to break it down to a point where it's a tangible thing that they can do, right? So those, those last layer of inputs is actually what becomes the goal. So that could be something, you know, blog traffic from organic tra from organic only becomes one input for one specific team. Um, you can also break it down farther as, as low as something like, you know, get 10 links a week. Uh, and that can keep going and keep going. So every type of output has a series and a series of inputs. The next thing you want to do is establish accountability for each person. This might be one of the more important things that you can do if you're looking to build growth-minded teams uh, and teams of autonomous A players, right? So once you've tapped into some of those existing strengths that people have, you want to place them into a situation where they have a higher chance of success. Uh, you've broken down your goals into these broad yet specific inputs. Uh, and typically, um, that person, once they have all of those breakdowns, is able to get ready for execution. Once they have a, a specific goal that they own and they can go into building that roadmap, um, they're much more likely to be successful, right? Uh, and so establishing that accountability, establishing that ownership makes people feel like they're the CEO within their own middle realm. So you actually wanna get them to create their own plan. A lot of top-down management styles will say, um, will tell people to you know, set a deadline for their uh, reports and their contributors. 
But if they are setting their own deadlines, they're creating that sense of accountability. They're the ones that are telling you that's what they think is possible and that's what they think um, they can achieve. Your job can be to guide that plan a little bit more to align with what you need it to achieve. But ultimately, you need to let them set that impact, set those deadlines for themselves. The next step is to communicate clearly and effectively. This might be obvious, but consistent and clear communication uh, is a must. And it becomes a little bit more complex as you start to scale your company a bit more. The, the layer of things that you need to communicate, the way that those things connect becomes really important. This is why I find it easier and better to actually create a visual representation of what that looks like so people can see the picture because generally we understand and we learn a lot better when we can see how the, that connection takes place, right? Um, there are different ways that you can communicate better, uh, such as planning consistent one-on-ones, giving direct and specific feedback, and you also need to be willing to accept variations of negative feedback. So one of the things that happens here is that we get caught up in the sense of knowledge bias, right? Knowledge bias means that we tend to think we know more because we have that context. This is what I mean by creating this visual representation. Um, and so by with that not knowledge bias, we tend to forget that a lot of people don't see that. So one-on-ones are a really good way to schedule, track, and improve what your, um, what your reports are doing. Uh, and it gives you an opportunity to understand you know, the exact plans that they have week by week, and you can find out how that ties back to their goals. It gives you an opportunity to create a little bit more of a relationship, get clear and constructive feedback from them and give them that feedback in return. Uh, and most importantly, you know, learn about any struggles that they might be facing. Um, so this is a simple breakdown. You can use Trello boards to help kind of structure those meetings. Another tool that's really effective that I like uh, is Know Your Team. Uh, but ultimately you wanna schedule this stuff on a week by week basis, uh, because if there's no improvement, uh, either you were not clearly communicating something or more important conversation needs to be had with your employees. When it comes to evaluations, this is just a quick note, uh, but what's been useful in the past is having a system to evaluate whether or not, you know, your team is actually adhering to the core values and, and meeting their expectations. Uh, there's a lot of debate on whether, you know, assessments and, and you know, structured assessments like this even work. Uh, we try to use something relatively simple, which is just a plus minus or plus minus system. Uh, pretty much we use this to reflect core values and goals. Um, if it's a plus, they're adhering to the core values. And typically if they're adhering to the core values, they're probably on track to hit their goals unless, you know, as a manager you've, or leader, you've maybe failed in communicating effectively. Um, plus minus means they're sometimes reflecting it. Minus means that they're rarely or never reflecting it. It's, uh, it's a more simple way of actually just keeping people aligned on what the right metrics of success are. And like I said, core values are a really good thing to hold people accountable to because it's more based on behavior rather than just effort or task-based. So we want to focus on income, uh, impact, right? Not uh, just effort. The next tip that I think is really important and something that takes a while to understand is relinquishing complete control. Um, as we discussed from the bottleneck problem, one of the main causes of this issue is, is that it stems from a need from control. Uh, for the most part, you know, delegating to other people on your team is usually comes from a fear of trust uh, and makes, and that makes sense, it's completely valid, uh, especially if you've always been one of the better contributors, why should you not help um, why should other people take over a channel or a process or framework that you've essentially built up? Um, so this is where having a better understanding of you can't always control the outcome. You need to be able to delegate and break that information down so that other people can take on what you've done and add their own spin to it. Uh, it won't always be perfect and it won't always be right, but you wanna help your team become better than you is kind of my frame of reference here. And that's how you know that you've done a good job. If you have other people on a team kind of calling you out on what you're not doing well, uh, that's a team that you can actually trust um, and hold accountable uh, and you can each hold accountable. What's important to know is that people will make, make mistakes. You kind of have to let that happen. Um, you don't want to just let it happen and never acknowledge it. You want to acknowledge it and point it out, but you just have to be aware that there is an opportunity for this error to happen. Uh, and most of us learn from making mistakes anyway, right? For instance, as children, we don't start running immediately. We usually fall down many times until we eventually get the hang of it. And that's how we learn and grow. 
Um, another note is you want to make sure that you're documenting every process that you have. Uh, this is really important to keep track of what works so that you can repeat it, but also that you have an ongoing system that you can build on top of and improve on an ongoing basis. This is both for um, helping you onboard and train new people as you scale, but also as a contingency plan in the event that somebody you know, leaves the company um, or something problematic occurs. So you wanna always have something in place and always be documenting what's actually working. Uh, and this is ultimately creating your playbook, right? So once you figure out what works, write it down and pass it on. This is another example of how you can help alleviate some of that bottleneck is part of how we trained up a lot of the team earlier on for things like links is I would uh, you know, spend one day just write out every single thought I had in my step-by-step -step process and my thought process on it. And then I would pass that on for somebody else. And we've iterated and consistently improved on some of these processes as new people have brought in different perspectives. So essentially you wanna think of this as like your manual for the growth machine that you're trying to build, right? This is all that you're gonna be able to take away with you from any company that you're at. It's your reputation and it's a document of what you've built. Um, it's kind of, I'll use an analogy here with theater, right? Uh, this is kind of like a script. So without a strong script, you're just doing improv, uh, which is fun, but it's usually pretty hit or miss if you're not really skilled in it and you don't have a ton of experience. So try to think of this as your ma the manual is a script for what's an actually, actually gonna be successful in terms of your company's growth. Uh, which brings me back to this point of, you know, constantly improving what works. Uh, again, a playbook is not something that's just static and just a structure that you just live with for the rest of your career. Uh, it's something that's a constantly iterative document, right? You want to keep making changes, cutting things, adding things to it. And this is where you can start distributing that um, accountability across your team. You do not have to write every chapter of your playbook. Uh, you can get other people to contribute to it. I think ours at Vengage now might be like 400 pages if everybody really, if you read every single thing, but we have a very strong structure of everything in place in the event that we need to reference it again. Um, and this kind of goes to the point of as you grow, it becomes harder to know everything, right? It's, it's, unre it's unrealistic for you to actually understand what's going on. So you need to help your team become more specialized and help them actually create this playbook and create this manual. Um, so set deadlines for their deliverables if this is something that you want to create as an ongoing process, um, especially in the early stages when you're testing new things. Uh, produce outlines of different chapters, get review those outlines and transfer that to your master document. So this way you're always making sure that things are on the right track and you have that review process in as part of your actual agenda, but you're not required to write everything out. Eventually what happens is you find these scalable methods that you continue to work on and you don't have to necessarily create all these new playbooks. Something might be just a small line or a little iteration here and there. But once you have that framework and that foundation, it becomes a lot easier to kind of reinforce that information. Um, and so by getting them to create these playbooks, there's another, this is also a method of learning, right? It helps reinforce information that the people already know on your team. It alleviates you from having to do everything and it helps you plan for the future so that, again, like I said, in the event that somebody leaves or something bad happens, there's a contingency plan in place. The, the, there's only a couple of tips left that I want to go through, but the next one is to lead by example. Um, one of the best leaders are the ones that are constantly showing your team first what the expected behavior is. This means that if you make a mistake, be vulnerable and be accountable for that mistake. Embody those core values yourself, define what excellence looks like and reinforce that behavior. Um, and if you have an ego and you can't be able to address your own issues, uh, the chances of your team being able to do that are very slim. So this is something, this is one of the most important things that you need to do. It's funny, I, this deck is actually just a good reflection for myself as well. Which brings me to the next point, which is self-reflect and always be learning. So um, I think, uh, I don't know if anyone's read the book, Grit by Angela Duckworth, uh, but she talks a lot about how deliberate practice leads to success. Um, and deliberate practice is this act of uh, taking specific action towards achieving a goal. So for instance, if you run every day without setting a specific goal, you probably aren't gonna improve. But if you run with the intention of going a little bit farther or a little bit faster and deliberately act towards achieving that, it becomes a lot more measurable and your chances of improving it rise. Uh, so by teaching your team to practice improvement deliberately, you can make sure that they're consciously working towards always bettering themselves. And the past year has been 
um, difficult for a lot of us to do that because of the pandemic. But this is a good reminder that, you know, there's little habits that we can still try to improve on. Uh, and there's little ways of doing this that may not be massive, but as long as you keep that practice of practicing up, um, it becomes a little bit easier to manage and you'll probably notice results faster. Um, the second last step that I want to go into is providing resources for improvement. Uh, your company can't scale if your team doesn't. Uh, so one of the things that we do a lot is encouraging growth interviews and we structure knowledge sharing meetings. So growth interviews, uh, just to quickly go over it, um, are these uh, different kind of like biweekly or monthly meetings that we do depending on how big your team is and where you're at, um, where you get people to connect and meet with industry experts. Um, I per uh, personally learn a lot from meeting other people and talking through exact um, case studies or examples of what worked and what didn't, um, and then get them to share that information with the rest of the team. So we're constantly leveling each other up. Not only does this help people build out a peer-to-peer -peer network with different individuals that are like-minded, um, but it also, again, alleviates that need for you to be the one that's always directly coaching them on every single thing, right? They're building out their own learning. Um, eventually this becomes habit and you need to stop reinforcing it and people will start to just naturally do this and naturally build these networks. Uh, and just a quick note on a resource library, um, as we're moving into remote, remote uh, work more and more and it's probably an inevitable future for us all, um, having something as simple as you know a resource channel on Slack to just share different ideas where people share like the TLDR um, and little snippets from what they've learned uh, in order to foster a culture of growth. Um, and lastly, of course, you want to enforce autonomy. Um, if you've already figured out by doing steps one through nine, you'll probably get to a point where autonomy naturally occurs. Um, and this is just a recap of, you know, setting those goals, promoting that purpose, uh, and giving people an opportunity to master something on their own. Uh, because the reality is that everyone has a motivation. Uh, figuring out each person's um, is a valuable skill and something that uh, is really important for a lot of managers. This is an example from Andy Grove's high output management on the hierarchy of needs. Uh, if we do a good job as leaders, eventually what happens is we start building intrinsically motivated people at the top, right? So we need to be able to connect those dots for a lot of people. Once you follow these trends and you actually have a system in place, you'll eventually find yourself hiring only A players uh, because you're actually deliberately focusing on it. So again, just to summarize, uh, at the root of it, you know, transitioning into this leadership position as you start building out the startup and, and scaling it up it doesn't have to be a daunting experience. It's not usually easy. It doesn't work the same way for everybody. Um, but hopefully this list of kind of skill sets that you can use um, will smooth out some of those road bumps that you guys might face along the way. Um, and at the core, really just identify those core values and hire and train people that embody and reflect those values and you'll probably find a team of really awesome, motivated people. Uh, as a final note, in terms of helping you guys, you know, communicate some of this information, uh, we put together a, a list of visual communication assets that help people uh, kind of understand and see how that vision, how that strategy all ties in together. Uh, so you can take a screenshot of this maybe and follow that link. Um, and there are just some resources there to help you figure out how you can actually uh, build out some of these communication reports. And thanks. I hope I didn't go over too long. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Nadia. It was excellent. Um, we have some time for Q&A. I'd like to give opportunity for everyone to submit a question. In the meantime, maybe we can uh, stop the screen share here and um, I can uh, kick things off by um, uh, while we're looking at the questions. Uh, you mentioned, Nadia, unless you have a slide actually, oh, okay, so this one leads to that special link and template. Uh, what would be the best way to get in touch with you, um, Nadia, for those who um, have follow-up questions and watching us on YouTube? Yeah, um, I can go back a slide, uh, but my Twitter handle is at the bottom there. It's just at Nadia Koja. Um, so Twitter or LinkedIn are probably, this is my handle across every social platform. So um, you can just find me on LinkedIn or Twitter. I'm probably less likely to answer emails because I'm not great when it comes to email. So LinkedIn or Twitter is the best, best course of action. Excellent. So you mentioned, you mentioned uh, at the very beginning that um, you, at some point you moved away from uh, tactics 
and uh, sort of non-scalable tactics and uh, committed to growth strategies. Uh, do you remember when this aha moment ca happened that, okay, it's, it's time to stop relying on that quick growth hacks and wins and just focus on, on the channels that are sustainable and working long-term? Yeah, um, I mean, one of the, one of the ways that we realized that uh, was when we started to scale up and start to hire more people. We went into, you know, trying to double our team, and what we realized is that we had a lot of roadblocks. And it's everyone's going to have tactic ideas. Everyone will always have ideas. When you're a smaller team, it's a lot easier to align on that because maybe you have like a small room, you have a meeting. It's easier to just like look over at somebody else and say, "Hey, does this make sense?" and have that conversation going. As the team gets larger, those natural conversations become harder to keep on track. So continuing to repeat that vision and the strategy becomes the most high leverage thing you can do to make sure that everybody is really aligned. And then your, your job kind of transitions into realigning, realigning, and making sure everyone's on the same page and connected to your vision. And if like the management team, for instance, isn't super aligned, that breaks the, the connection. Uh, this is something that's be that was difficult this year specifically because we were a very strong in-person culture. Moving into remote became hard to keep that communication open, and so we've we you know we've had our own growth struggles. But I think the beginning of this year has like re we've really learned from our own struggles from the past year. Um, but that was that was a big learning moment for us. Was you know you can't just rely on everyone always being on the same page, especially when you're not when you're remote um, and frequently iterate, like frequently communicating that alignment is so much more important than just focusing on what tactics are working or not. Makes sense. So yeah, the reason um, I, I asked that question, we have a, um, we have a quick background here for, from an early stage uh, co-founder who him and his co-founder are the only people who are working on the startup. Um, they focus in on their product, uh, product and development and uh, it seems like they don't even didn't make their first uh, marketing and sales hire just yet. So they're looking for some specific steps and action items uh, that they should start doing, maybe leading up to that uh, the first hire um, when it comes to um, so I'm looking at the question exactly. When it comes to sales and growth marketing solutions, implementation is a long process. Mul multiple level levels of context are required, such as business users' internal developments. So what are this, those foundations that you recommend for the early stage founders to get started with? Uh, yeah, so I think there's there's like a few things that I would, I guess, ask for clarification here is, one, do you have funding? If you have funding, maybe go for the VP hire, like, because you have that option. If you don't, and like you're bootstrapping and you just need somebody to start executing and, and testing things out, it's a hundred percent that person's core value fit and personality. Um, for instance, one of the internal words that we use is like that hunter mentality, right? Somebody who's like hungry to win. You may not have to train, you, you don't have to untrain, you don't have to like get them to come in with this, this high level of experience and build out a team, but there's somebody who can just like run with it, um, who has a, a proven track record of actually just like testing things out and executing and, and some form of results, right? One of the questions I often like to ask people, um, at least at the earlier stage, just to get an idea of that sense of core value fit is um, what is something that something creative or something, I guess, outlandish that they did as a child or at a really young age that people still reference or talk about today? To me, that kind of sets the precedent that if they were already entrepreneurial as a young, at a young age, that's an inherent like tact or an inherent quality of that person or a characteristic. Um, and if they can find oh, and if they're if it's something that they keep thinking about and it comes to mind right away, you see like this change. In their personality and you see their eyes light up in a different way and the the bs wall goes down right and you start to like actually understand who this person is um there's no right or wrong answer to that question it really depends on what you see as a good quality um assessment in terms of that entrepreneurial skill set but i think it, at that early stage the entrepreneurial mindset is much more important um if you don't have that big budget and you just want somebody who who's driven to win love That's it my two cents no, sounds um, uh, sounds great. And 
in terms of onboarding your first hire at the very early stage startup, right? At Vengage, you have that 400 uh, pages book that you, I'm assuming you give to everyone, right? Or what's the process? Yeah. Because the question, the reason why I'm asking that question is also setting up the goals, right? Everybody needs to understand why you're doing it and what is the goal, but you don't tell them how. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you have that growth uh, processes playbook that sort of should have put them on the right course. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the playbook is very, so you've highlighted a good point. There is the process part, right? Um, which comes at the execution level. So if you remember that slide where I kind of broke everything down to the KPI, the process piece is like at that end level, that's to execute, um, which is good for training people on what already works. But I like, again, going back to like, depending on what stage of the company you're at, at a larger stage where, you know, you have more than 50 people, you don't need to jump, you don't want to jump into processes. You need to connect them at the vision first. You need to make sure all of that stuff aligns. Um, and some of those processes are things that you're already doing. So if you're scaling up an existing team, like let's say you're scaling up a small function of that company, of your company, yeah, those processes are relevant because now you're just trying to continue and increase that velocity. If you're going into new channels or new tactics, bit of a, it might be a different game, right? Um, the good thing here is that in the event that somebody who may be leading that team, uh, you know, leaves the company after a few years, which happens, um, you want to have something in place where you can still train up, right? Like you don't want to have every you, part of hiring people who figure out new processes is to gain that knowledge and have it become something repeatable for the company that you can actually expand on. Um, so even like, uh, you know, some people that have left uh, my team on Vengage, like one of the things that we do on offboarding is like, make sure you update everything. And like, these are the things that you do well that I want to document because these are the parts of why you were so good at this job, right? There's like little habits there that um, that become really relevant, uh, but it's not necessarily. I don't make everybody read all of it because it's like insane. We've now kind of restructured it into folders so that it's broken down by different areas and a little bit easier to navigate. Um, it's not all in one document because that thing would take forever to load. Um, so it's like multiple documents now, and different people own different parts of it. Great. We have so many questions. I just want to get to at least a few more of them. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the long-term vision and motivation. How do you keep team uh, motivated long-term? Do you have any specific incentives in addition to monetary incentives um, or any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, for sure. And it's like, obviously now we're at a stage where we're making money where we can actually like give people um, that incentive that's a little bit more monetary. We One of the things that we've been trying to work on a lot is, you know, we have great benefits. We put a lot of investment into things like mental health. We have unlimited personal days and sick days. We, we try to like encourage people to feel autonomous. Um, actually just hired somebody recently who was saying how at their previous company, they had to have like a link online all the time on Hangouts, just in case the manager wanted to check in and make sure they're working, which I think is insane. Like, I think usually I'll tell my team, I don't care if you work two hours a day. I don't care if you work 10 hours a day. I'm like, there's an output that you have to hit like you're an adult go figure out how to do that um tell me what i could do to help you get there but there's i think now especially like with millennials and you know gen z we want to just do our work because we want to do it if you kind of encourage that and encourage that trust and autonomy people respect that right and i think a lot of a lot of it comes down to a give and take of respect and trust um, and if people trust you and they respect you, they're more likely to do their best for you because we're all much more likely to help out our friends than we are to help out a stranger, somebody that we don't like. Um, so yes, there's like monetary incentives and all of those things are there too. Naturally, we still have a life to live and we have our own like ambitions, but I think at the core of it, you really need to be able to respect people and listen to them and help support them in their goals. And if they feel supported, they're more likely to support you back. And quick follow-up questions on setting the goals specifically. Should probably have time for one more. Um, so how do you get your team members to commit to the goals? Uh, goals needs to be ambitious yet achievable, right? Do you actually assign a goal and then sort of get the feedback or do you come up with the goals together? Is, is there a balance? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that we've been doing this year um, 
and like the end of last year is like buy-in is really important. Um, people, if somebody just came to me and arbitrarily gave me a number, like go get $50 million next week. I'm like, that's ridiculous. Like, why should I do that? How did you come to this number? Why are we coming to this conclusion? It's hard to see that, that connection, um, which again was a learning experience, right? Like I used to do like a huge forecasting. I would be given a goal from the CEO, like, okay, does this make sense? Like, does this number seem to work? And I'll be like, yeah, sure. Like I buy into it. Right. And if I just like go and forecast and I'm like, here's a number and people are like, why this number? Why is 12 million the school? Like, why is this the goal, right? Like, how are we gonna get this many links? Um, it becomes harder to align them back. So it's, I think it depends on the, the individual, but some people on the team, for instance, prefer to just be given a number. They're like, just tell me how many things I need to go get. Another person is like, I want to define those goals with you and like work with you to understand exactly how it connects back. So it depends on who, the person is. I work with the team leads directly to figure out some of those metrics. It's something that we've been starting to do and then help them break it down. But it is an, uh, an ongoing process, right? It's like, it's like a, a constant iteration. Every quarter you want to realign, reset and get that buy-in again. But if you have that buy-in, um, it becomes a lot easier to make sure that everybody is actually on the same page and wants to to hit those numbers. If they have no connection as to why they're doing it, it's gonna be really hard to keep people motivated. Thank you so much, Nadia, for joining us. One last um, quick uh, question. A lot of people asked about books and resources. I know that we have to wrap up. How do you learn as a growth leader? How do you train your growth mindset yourself constantly? And uh, any uh, strategies and tips? Yeah. Um, so like I said, I, I, I learn a lot by just, I, I'm an extrovert naturally. I like to talk to other people and like learn specific skills. And I find that Googling things are good for getting an in or an idea um, of what to ask. Um, but I find that people having like real conversations with people who are already doing the thing I want um, to get to is the best thing for me. So right now I have like two different coaches that I'm working with, for instance, that have already successfully accomplished some of the goals, the ARR goals that I'm trying to hit. Um, and those are people that have been there, done that. So I find coaching to be really helpful. Uh, and I'll do that for like people who are at that stage of getting the 10 million, right? Like I'll coach um, for the people that I can, but I think that it's important to just be leveling up. I do read a lot of books. Um, it's important. I think it's nice for inspiration, but um, one thing I want to be wary about is not necessarily just taking a new book and trying to implement a new process because uh, that can really shake things up. Um, so I find, yeah, the coaching thing is where I'm at right now. And that's like what's my biggest growth method uh, at this time. But I'm happy to recommend any books. Uh, I can, I don't know if I can just send an email with some of my favorites, but in terms of management, high output management is the, a must read. Uh, anything by um, Ben Horowitz, I recommend. Uh, Creativity Inc. from Ed Catmull. I liked that book a lot. That was like a nice uh, overview of just general management. A TV show, Ted Lasso on Apple Plus. <laughs> It's, it's like a, a humorous TV show, but there was like a lot of nice motivating team building stuff in there. So it was extremely, um, extremely insightful. And I'm looking forward to having Nadia back at our traction webinars in the future. Thank you so much for joining us. And we're looking forward to seeing you next week. Thanks. Take care. I need some traction.